God give me a message, and I am happy to deliver it tonight. And it seems like everything that's happened today has just led right up to this. So, you know, God's good. He knows what he's doing um, all the time. God's always good. So if you all want to uh, make your way to Matthew 6.33, I want to speak just a little bit there. I've got four or five little verses, and I'll let you out of here. Yeah, one of Pastor's old tricks there, huh? <laughs> yeah. Nah, it won't take long. It won't take long at all. But I do want to have your attention tonight because God's got something really important for us. Okay, well, let's pray then. Let's pray. Let, let, me, let me say a prayer and get this going. Father God, I thank you for the message that you've given me, Lord. Father God, I ask that, that all our hearts be prepared to accept the word, Lord. Father God, I ask that you soften our hearts, Lord. And Father God, just allow us to accept it as it's meant to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Now you can put it up there, brother. title tonight is Seek, and can you imagine what we should be seeking? Um, it says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So let's break it down just a little bit. Starts out, but seek. So let's just stop right there for a second. But seek. What does that mean to seek? That means... To aim for something and try to try to try to get it, you know, um, thrive after. It doesn't mean, oh, I don't see it. I'm gonna quit. I'm gonna sit down. I'm done. I'm tired. It means to seek. You know what? If you if you lose your wallet, if you lose your wallet or you lose your purse and there's 500 bucks in it. You know what? Your face is going to be red. You're going to be shaking. You're going to be looking with everything you've got. You're going to be looking under things. You're going to be looking on top of things. You're going to be accusing people even probably. Hey, they're going to be looking for that big money. <laughs> <laughs> that big money. That's right. But when we seek God, why can't we get that frantic about it? Why can't we get down on our knees and say, Father God, I need you. Right. See what I mean? What did Pastor talk about this morning? He talked about that big money and making money more important than God. But you know what? We've got to have money. Money's a tool. It's something that we use to get along with. But God is a necessity. God is an absolute necessity. Without God, we can't be Christians. <laughs> well, without God, we would be, we would be dust. We would be nothing. Okay, so first the kingdom of God. Seek the kingdom of God. Well, I thought I was supposed to be seeking God. Well, what is the kingdom of God? Well, that's where God lives and what he rules over. Think about what a kingdom is. You know, when you think about a kingdom, okay, it's got a king, it's got some palaces, it's got a big outlying area. All the important people are in that palace. You know, he's got the earls and the nobles and you know what, you know, and then, then the outline, then the servants' quarters probably, and then, then all the outlying areas. And when you get way out there, there's the peasants and the, you know. Well, God has a kingdom too. You know, but God doesn't have peasants. Do you know what God has? God has people who have not learned the word of God yet. Have not learned the truth about God yet. That's what, that's what in God's outlying kingdom, they're poor because they don't have the truth. They haven't allowed God to work in them so that they know the truth. That's why they're in the outlying areas. And then, so by that, can you figure out what the servants are and what the kings and the, or what the princes and the nobles and the earls and what have you are? 
See what I mean? Where do you want to be in the kingdom? And his righteousness. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What is his righteousness? That's his way of doing things and being right. You know, God's got an order of the way that things have got to happen. First of all, you can't, you can't do anything that's deceiving. You can't do anything that has anything to do with evil. It can't have anything to do with being unfair. Amen. It can't be anything to do with lying, lying cheating, anything. Yeah. Not, it can't have anything to do with sin. With sin. Exactly. It can't have anything to do with bad thoughts. It can't have anything to do with, with hate or even unlove. Nothing negative. It's all positive. That's what God's righteousness is. That's where God's trying to get us to. Oh, perfectness. That's the point. You know, God is trying so hard working in us trying to get us to a point of righteousness, you know? And a lot of times we just fight them. You know, and I can look back in my life, I can even look back probably the day before yesterday and say, well, you know, I wasn't cooperating with God very good. You know, I, I, I wasn't outright saying, no, God, I'm not going to do it. But I wasn't listening close enough to really figure out that God was prodding me. God was telling me. God was teaching me. Is everybody kind of like that? Maybe so. Maybe so. And all these things will be added unto you. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek. Aim after. Thrive. Try to obtain. Try with all your heart to obtain. First the kingdom of God. Try to get to where God lives. Be a part of his kingdom. Participate in the kingdom and his righteousness be like God be like God as much as you can yeah maybe we can't be perfect but we can sure thrive to be we can do the best that we can to, to, to have the mind of God to act the way that God would act to think the way that God would think And then it says, and all these things will be added to you. What will be added to you? All, it just says all these things. Well, if you go up a couple of verses, it's, it's talking about just the necessities of life. What will I eat or what will I drink or what will I see? And it's going back to the money thing again. You know, all these things will be added to you. You know, and I can understand someone's... Uh, uh, desperateness someone's despair if they have nothing if they don't have a shirt on their back they don't have anything over their over their heads for a roof they don't have a car they don't you know I can understand that they might be in despair but most of us have all those things and most people do but it's like what pastor was talking about today those aren't our riches. The best riches are the ones that we receive from God. Amen. And the best is yet to come. You know, God says, you know, if we put all these things first, everything that we need will be given to us. We won't go hungry. We won't be thirsty. We'll always have clothes to wear. We can get to where we're going. It'll all be provided for us. But put God first. Participate in his kingdom. It's another promise. The Bible is so full of promises that a lot of times we don't even recognize that it's just amazing. God has so many promises for us. And you know what? Who can fulfill a promise like God? There's none like him. There's none like you, Lord. There is none. So, uh, spending... If I don't spend time with God in my life, if I don't take the time each day, several times a day, I can see myself going downhill real quick. You know, and as soon as things start to, 
And I'm like everybody else. I have a selfish nature. A selfish nature. And I think generally everybody probably does. I mean, because we're living inside this body and this is where our mind is, you know. So we have a tendency to try to put this first, you know. But if we put God first, what does it say? Seek ye first God. If we put God first, everything changes. But if I, if I don't put God first, it's hard for me to function properly. Things just seem to kind of go down the tubes. Things aren't going right. Oh, Lord, I'm so sorry I didn't talk to you. You know, if I don't make God first, nothing else in my life seems to work. You know, you are, you are. Now, if you're not a Christian, if you've never been saved, if you've never been baptized, then you don't notice the difference. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's it. Then you say, well, if I didn't have bad luck, I wouldn't have any at all. You know, God doesn't like being second or third or fourth or last in our lives. He doesn't like it. He really wants a relationship with us. You know, when we get desperate enough, We'll turn off the phone. We'll say no to our friends. We'll get rid of all the distractions. We'll turn off the TV. You know, we'll go into another room. We'll get rid of all the distractions. And that's where we can talk to God. And we need to do that. We need to do that not only on a daily basis. We need to do it as often as we can. You know... That you can usually work and talk to God at the same time. You can perform functions and talk to the Lord at the same time. And you know what's really good about it? It's usually if you're working, you're frustrated about something else at work. And you can give it all to God right there. You know what? And so do I. You know what? And that's what God wants us to do. God wants a relationship with each and every one of us. God made us. For a purpose. <sighs> and you know what? When we get alone with God, when we shut everything else out, and we get alone with, uh, all alone with God, when it's just us and God, you know what? That's when we get our breakthroughs. That's when we get our inspirations. That's when we get the answers we've been looking for. That's when things start to happen. It doesn't make any much sense to not do it. But woe is us because we are human. Well, you know what? We need God so badly. Luke 18.1 The very short, simple little verse <clears throat> says one day Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never get up I see here it says and he spoke a parable unto them to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint don't ever give up you know I've seen so many Christians with weak hearts and I don't mean that they're fixing to have a heart attack I'm saying that they don't got no guts as soon as something starts to happen, they're going to faint. They're going to fall off. You know, Jesus taught his disciples to always pray and never give up. You know? Well, the sad thing is just getting people to pray is one thing. But they give, people give up way too easy. You know? If Jesus taught his disciples to pray and never give up, aren't we also disciples of Jesus? There's a lot to pray about. There's a lot to pray about in our own lives. I mean, we, we can probably stay pretty busy just praying for the things in our own lives and our own tight-knit little family. And then when you start, when you, if you go to school, you got a lot to pray about. You go to church, I, you even got more to pray about. You go to work. You got a whole, 
you know what? The more people you run into, the more that you have to pray about. Yep. You know? We do need patience, too. We definitely do. Yeah, pray. pray. If you pray for patience, God's going to teach you patience. I will tell you that. Isn't that right, Sister Vi? Yeah. <laughs> just stay on that subject for just a second. How do you learn patience? Yeah. The way that you learn patience is you, you're put through things that you don't like to go through. You're put through things that irritate the snot out of you. You're put through things that you wouldn't normally put yourself, if you had a choice, you wouldn't go through it. That's how you learn patience. Am I right? Am I right? So true. So if you ever pray for patience, you know what you're in for. And patience, that's right, pray, but we should all have patience. You know, you can't call it, does God have patience? God's got a lot of patience. God's got a lot of patience. Okay, are you all ready for this? If we seek God only when we're desperate, then he'll keep us in des desperate circumstances because he deeply desires to fellowship with us. What do you all think about that? What do you all think about that? Isn't that true? God will rescue us and get us out of trouble when we come to him. But if we want to stay in a place of constant victory, we must diligently seek him at all times and desire to experience his continual presence in our everyday lives. You know, we shouldn't just be experiencing God when we come to church. We should be experiencing God all day long. Church is just the topping on the cake. It's just the icing. It's just the really sweet stuff. But the cake's good too. And you know what? I have felt the presence of God in my study, Dan, as much as I've felt at church. Now, I'm not trying to say don't come to church because, you know, what I'm saying is you can have a wonderful, yes, you can have a wonderful relationship with God, and it doesn't matter where you're at. Paul proved to us in the Bible that you could be in prison and have a joyous time with the Lord. You know, he also told us that he could be shipwrecked and have a wonderful time in the Lord. He could almost be dead. He could be hungry. You know what? What's wrong with us? Sometimes I think we're looking after too much after our physical and our desires and our comfort rather than our spiritual intake of daily God every day. Sometimes we just want to be comfortable. <clears throat> Which is okay. There's nothing wrong with being comfortable. But you know what? God would rather you grow closer to Him than to be comfortable. God loves us and He wants good things for us, but is mostly desires to have a personal relationship with each and every one of us. That's what He wants. And that is more important to Him than our comfort. I, this might be bad news for, you know, I had to just kind of hang my head <laughs> because it is so true. Okay. We must never forget that relationship is built on fellowship. Y'all know what that means? That means that you can't get close to somebody unless you spend a lot of time with them. That's what that means. And that, that's, that's not only true 
between humans, but think about it in, in human terms. You know, me and Jason can't be friends if we don't ever spend any time. If he don't know what I like and, and I don't know what he likes, you know, or we don't have anything in common or we don't ever speak or, you know, maybe every once in a while I go to Jason and say, hey, man, I need your burn pile, you know. <laughs> and he says, go ahead. You know, and that, that's all it is to it. That's not much of a relationship. I mean, he's being nice, and I'm being a little selfish, and, you know. But <laughs> that's not much of a relationship, you know. But he owns property, and I own property. But when we can walk together around his property and talk about, you know, some of his desires and some of the things he'd like to do and, some of the things that maybe he tried to do and some of the things that he's done and I can relate to a lot of it, that draws us a little closer. Well, you know what? God understands every single thing that we're going through. Why? Isn't that right, Sister Vi? Why is that? Because Jesus came to earth as a human and experienced every single thing there is to experience as a human. God came to earth in human form. His name was Jesus Christ. He came here to draw us closer to God. That is the only way that we can get to God. It's through Jesus. Praise God. You know, God's got such a plan. It's so awesome. Isn't it awesome? Could we think of doing something like this? Boy, I'm pretty sure I'd have it botched up before I even created anything. Okay, we'll go to my next point. <laughs> Poor platypus. <laughs> Spending time with God puts everything else in perspective. Okay, what does that mean? That means if you spend time with God, we're going to see more clearly. We're going to understand things more. Uh, we're, does that mean that, you know, that God's going to fix our eyeballs and he's going to, you know, he's going to fix the test for us? So that, No, it means we'll understand spiritual things more in fact it even goes further than that we'll even understand other human beings a little bit more because you know what if you spend a lot of time with God God will start to show you things you'll start to understand people even more and how they act even more We'll have more peace. We get renewed. <laughs> we get strengthened. We understand more why things are happening. Not only to us, but to other people. Why wouldn't we want to spend more time with God? I'm trying to encourage you people. I'm trying to encourage you all to spend more time with God. I love going and shutting myself in the... It's, you know what? It's kind of hard to get myself to do it a lot of times. But when I can go in that den and shut that door, you know, turn on a little bit of music so I can't hear nothing else in the house. I can't hear anything outside the window. And me and God can just have a good old time. You know what? I give my problems to God, and he tells things about, you know, about himself, you know. He explains things to me, you know. He'll lead me to places in the Bible so I can understand better. And you think you get the chill bumps here in church? I can do the same thing. Okay, we'll move on to another point. 
Part-time Christians cannot defeat full-time demons. You know what? Satan and his demons are working overtime every single day. They're not taking a rest. They're not taking their breaks. They're not even going for a coffee break or a smoke break and making the big money. That's right. <laughs> But if we're a part-time Christian, we're going to be defeated every time because the demons are working full-time. They are working full-time. We, we don't really stand much of a chance if we're a part-time Christian. Does everybody understand that? Satan's a liar. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. You know, and we let him do it. If you're a part-time Christian, you're going to let him do it. Why? Because you're defenseless. Because you don't have God. God does not have your back if you're a part-time Christian. I hate to say it like that, but that's the way it is. You know what? If you're going to be part-time for God, guess what? God's going to be part-time for you. It's so important to be a full-time Christian. <sighs> Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. You know, he does this. He doesn't do it physically. He does it by deceptions and by lies. He does it in ways that you can't see it because it's all by deceptions and lies. And he's... he's feeding you a line every single time that you go to do something right. He's trying to get you to change your mind and do something wrong. And every time you're trying to get closer to God, you know what? If you don't ever open your Bible or go to church, Satan don't mess with you. If you don't ever pray, he's not going to mess with you. And the bad thing is, is, you know, Satan used to just sneak in the back door of the church. Now he just walks in with everybody else. Satan's getting bolder and bolder, but Christians are getting laxer and laxer. You know, God hasn't changed. Christians have changed. Okay, let's uh, move on to Colossians 3.10. I don't want to take up too much of your time tonight, but there are some important things that God wanted me to tell you. <clears throat> I'm going to read it out of the Life Application Bible. Here it says, have, and have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Okay, here this says, put on your new nature... And be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. Excuse me. Put on your new nature. What does that mean? That means get rid of your evil ways of thinking. Get rid of your lax ways of thinking even. Get rid of the world's way of thinking. How do you like that? Because it's so easy just to start thinking like everybody else. Well, everybody else does it. How many times have you heard that in your life? Well, everybody else does it. It must be okay. You know, how much of a lie is that? Isn't that a lie? Start God's ways of thinking and doing. Put on your new nature. Paul describes it as easy as taking off your old evil clothes and putting on your nice new church clothes. That's, that's how he explains it. To just put on your new nature. It sounds really simple. It's not really a... a, a, a it doesn't sound like a hard thing to do. It can be di pretty difficult. But the way you can do it easily is to do it with a made-up mind. You know, you just say, I'm going to serve God no matter what. And nothing's going to get in my way. 
nothing. I don't care if my friends, you know, the old saying, uh, what I just say, uh, well, everybody else is doing it. I guess it's okay. Or it'll be just once. God will understand. No, that doesn't work. That does not work. Be renewed. Be renewed. Just put on your new nature and be renewed. Be changed. Be born again. When we were, when we were all saved, weren't we born again? And put on new nature, and we put on those new clothes and say, and we were so excited to do the right thing. But the world has a way of trying to conform us, trying to drag us in, say, it's okay. That's just Satan saying, it's okay. A little bit won't hurt. Just once won't hurt. <sighs> put on your new nature and be renewed. As you learn to know your, your creator and become like him. The more time you spend with God, the more quality time you spend with God, the more you're going to become like him. You know what? People will rub off on you. The world will rub off on you. But you know what? It's even better to let God rub off on you. Don't let the world rub off on you. That's not the place you want to go. You're a soul made by God, made for God, and made to need God, which means we're not made to be self-sufficient. What's that mean? We are designed to have God in our lives all the time. You know what? When God, when God created the first people, Adam and Eve, God wanted to be with them all the time. You know what? And then sin came in right away. So what happened? God couldn't spend much time with his people. There was a select few, Isaiah, David, and there was probably a lot that weren't even recorded in the Bible, but really very few people compared to how much the world is populated, you know. But then he came to earth and sacrificed himself so that we could have relationship with him. So we could be close to him. So he could send the Holy Spirit into us. We need to take advantage of that. God's got so much for us. What are we going to do with it? We just can't get along without God. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed that? Then what's wrong with us a lot of times? That we won't seek God when we need to. That self thing. Okay, 1 Corinthians 4.20. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. I had a hard time understanding what that meant out of the King James Version. So I'm going to read it right here says, for the kingdom of God is not just a lot of talk. It's living by God's power. It's a real thing. It's not just a bunch of talk. It's not just, oh, certain people talk about this thing called God and, you know, it's really nothing. It really is. I know everybody here knows that there's a God and how great he is. It's not just a lot of talk. It better not be just, if it's just a lot of talk in your life, you're probably wasting your time. We need to show action. How do we show action? Spending time with God. It's not just made up. It's not just imaginary. It's all living by the power of God, just like you and me are. Living. Okay, we're going to start winding this up. Let's go to Isaiah. God's talking to us in Isaiah. Isaiah 43, verses 18 and 19. And I'm going to read it out of the life application again here. It says, but forget all that. 
There's nothing compared to what I'm going to do. <clears throat> For I'm about to do something new. See, I've already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. You know what? When God was giving me all this, and then he showed me this, I got excited. I started jumping up and down. God wants to do a new thing Amen. with all of us. You know what? He doesn't want to leave anybody out. He wishes that nobody would perish. It's our own decisions what we do with it. God says, forget about all that. And verse 18 says, forget about all that. What? All the stuff in the past. You know what the past is for? A learning experience. That's all the past is for. A learning experience. It's nothing to dwell on. It's for a learning experience. It's time to move forward. It's time to move on. Then he goes on and says, It is nothing compared to what I'm going to do. Everything that God's done. In the, you know what? You know what was in the past? God created everything. Was that a miracle? Can you imagine being able to stand back and watch creation happening? You know, people think that when somebody is healed, that's a huge miracle. When a, a lame person can jump up and walk, they think that's a huge miracle. Some of the biggest miracles in my mind is when God created everything. Think about the enormity of that. Think about what was going on when that happened. Amen. You know, a lot of times we just think, you know, well, we live on this earth. Or Can you imagine watching God create the earth? Let alone everything else that he created. And then he created us human beings. I mean, I think it's magnificent. I think it's I think it's so miraculous it just blows my mind. Six days too, brother. That's uh yeah, at a record amount of time. Record you know, our best genius scientists couldn't even think about it. <laughs> but God says he wants to do something new. Doesn't that excite you? Doesn't that excite you? God wants to raise up a new nation, people. God wants to raise a nation with no boundaries. You know, most nations, they got that geographical boundary around them. You know, it says, this is Iraq, this is Iran, this is Israel, this is the United States. God's not raising up a nation like that. God's raising it up. Our boundaries are, do we love God or do we not love God? And I know which side of the boundary I'm on. Doesn't that excite you that God wants to do something new? Amen. God says, <laughs> what he's fixing to do isn't nothing. What, what he did before isn't nothing compared to what he's fixing to do. Ooh, Think of the possibilities. Amen. Think of all the wonders. We're looking into the future, people. You know, the only part about the future in the Bible is pretty much revelations. All the rest of it is pretty much past. I mean, there's a few prophecies that haven't come true. But can anybody really understand revelations very well? A lot of people guess a lot about it. And a lot of people say, yeah, I understand it. But I've never heard anyone be able to explain it. You know, I was told that if you can't explain it to a 12-year-old, then you don't understand it yourself. You know, I, I know people that couldn't explain it to other, you know. They've tried to explain revelations before sometimes, and, and uh, they couldn't explain it to me. And I'm a little bit older than 12, just a little bit. God's got some exciting things coming up for us. God's already beginning. Don't you feel it? Don't you feel it? Don't you have suspense? I mean, 
I just can't wait to see what comes next. I think everyone should be jumping up and down. No one's excited. No one's excited like I am. This nation is going to be defined by what's in your heart. Amen. Yeah. Okay, we're going to wrap it. I got another good point here that the Lord wants me to think, uh, bring out, though. Okay, Lord. What you think about God determines how you live your life. Think about it. I've heard that some people say that God is rude. How do you think that gentleman lived his life? Probably rudely. Yeah. He, if, if you think that God is rude, that he won't do anything for anybody, then you're going to live your life recklessly. That's what you're going to do. And who would follow a rude God anyway? If you think that God can't do anything and everything, you're not going to live for a God like that either because you'll be able to help yourself better than your God could help you. What kind of God do we serve? A loving God? A merciful God? An all-powerful God? An all-knowing God? An all-caring God? A God that's in control of everything, including our lives, if we allow him to? He who kneels before God can stand before anyone. You know what? Don't, don't ever put man before God. Oh, God. There's some things that God wants us to remember. God has promises for us. We should be excited about all of his promises. We should be excited that God wants to do new things. Not only in our personal lives, but he wants to do things with his nation. But we have to get our hearts to the right place. We have to be compatible with what God wants to do. Lord, give me the words. We... <laughs> We have to allow God to work in us to get us to a place that we need to be so that we can do God's work. We have to be willing. We have to be able also. You know, God's, God's trying to prepare all of us. God is preparing all of us. For what? For the wonderful things he's about to do. And you know what? If we was to leave today, then he's preparing us for heaven. But God wants to use each and every one of us to do wonderful, marvelous, fabulous things. He has a treasure for us. What kind of God do we serve? An awesome God, but how awesome is he? God wants us to remember these things. He says, I'll give you rest. When you're tired, when you're weary, when you've been doing my work, when you're out there and you've been doing all things, I'll give you rest. He says, and then after that, after I've given you rest, I'll strengthen you. I'll pick you up by the seat of your pants. I'll stand you on solid ground. I'll strengthen you. I'll nourish you. I'll make you strong again. I'll make you feel good. And then he says, when you pray to me, I will answer you. You know what? A lot of people are going around saying they don't have their prayers answered. That's because they're not seeking and because that's the kind of God they think they do, that they serve. They serve a God that doesn't answer their prayers, so their prayers aren't being answered. Yeah. 
That's one of the points that God wants to make here tonight. And, you know, I have a feeling that God's making this point not just here. All Christians are going to hear this message, I have a feeling. It's one that really needs to be put out there. I felt very deserving for God to give me this. I think this is a very special message. I don't think I'm important at all. I think I'm probably the least of everybody, and I'm barely even a pastor. But you know what? I do seek God, and I try to listen, and I try to tune in to what God's trying to tell me. God says he believes in each and every one of you. You know what? God says you have purpose. All of you have purpose. I just, God says I just got to get to you to a point to where you're usable. Don't you want to be usable by God? That's right. That's right. There, God says, I will bless you. There's one that everybody wants to hear. But God wants to bless each and every one of us. We need to be deserving of blessings, though. You know, God says he'll bless us, but there's, it all hinges on what we do also. It goes both ways. God says, I'm for you. God, I'm not against you. I am for you. I'm trying to do everything to build you up, to lead you in the right direction, to get you through that crossroads, going down the right road. You know, and everything that happens to us, everything, every situation that we go through is because God is trying to direct us. God is strengthening us. He's building us up. He's sending us down the right road. He's strengthening us by putting us through things. You know what? You don't get strong by sitting on the couch. You got to do things. God wants to strengthen us, so he puts us through the obstacle course. It's a really a wonderful thing. God says, I will not fail you. God says, I'll provide for you. He might not give you everything you desire and you want, but he's going to give you everything you need every time. I don't see anybody here doing without. God says, I'll be with you. And God says, I love you, each and every one of you. He loved us before we even thought about going to church. He loved us as we were conceived. He loves us so much. He just wants the best for us. And he wants to spend time with you. God says, I want your time. I'm jealous of all your other gods. You spend more time in front of the TV or you spend more time gabbing on the phone or you spend more time with Facebook than you do with me and it's just not right he says Amen. he says I have loved you I've cared for you I've taken care of all your needs I've taken care of everything you've ever needed even some of the things you've wanted I've I've looked after you I've had your back I've sent you down the right roads I've helped you to make all the right decisions And you're spending more time with everything else than me. That's what the Lord says. He who kneels before God can stand before any person. Think about that. What are you doing when you're kneeling before God? Hope, I, hope the, I hope the first thing you're not thinking of is asking him for stuff. But at least you're spending time with him if you are. But if you're kneeling before God, we should be worshiping Him, praising Him, and saying, God, you're so awesome for all the wonderful things that you do. Show me more. Reveal to me more, Lord. Show me. I'd like to have an altar call right now. If anybody feels like coming to the altar to get some more of God, to say, 
God, help me remember to come closer to you. God, help me remember to spend more time with you. God, help me remember to talk to you while I'm idly d doing other things. Jason, can you play that song? God wants such good things for us, and we seem to just ignore him a lot of times. And kind of act like, God who? Oh, he's just the one that created me. He's the one who loved me. He's the one who had my back. And I guess, I guess that's why he compares himself to a parent all the time. Because I know that parents feel that way a lot. You know, there's no storm that God won't carry you through. There's no bridge that God won't help you cross. There's no battle that God won't help you win. There's no heartache that God won't help you let go of. God's so much bigger than anything we'll ever face. You know, and we go through stuff and we complain. You know, instead of complaining, we should be searching God and getting understanding and getting victory. God just wants a personal relationship with each and every one of us. God is so good. God has been so good to us. I know he's been good to me. You know, I serve an awesome God. I, I don't know what, what God that anybody else serves. It's not any of my business. But I, I serve a God that is loving and caring and wonderful. It's awesome. You know, I can't even imagine can't even imagine. That's why nobody's seen the face of God. Because it would blow your mind. We wouldn't be able to take it. That's right. 